on, let's put your hands together again and give the Lord a hand praise. Just to give him the highest praise for who he is. How many of you in here are determined? I'm not going back. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. He brought me out of Egypt. I'm not going back anymore. Amen. God is an awesome God. He's just, he is just one awesome God. Amen. Amen. Before we get started, um, before we get started, I just want you guys to give a shout out. Um, he's not here, but Pastor Queen and, and Mrs. Queen, they are on a cruise and they're leaving today. So come on and give a shout out to them. I'm so happy they're taking a break. So he'll be out this Sunday and next Sunday. In fact, he forgot that he was going to be on a cruise and he called me. He said, I gave my Sunday school an assignment, my class, a Sunday school assignment. I forgot all about it. I wasn't going to be in church. So for those of you who are in Pastor Queen's Sunday school, He's going to be gone for two Sundays, but he'll be back Sunday after next. Amen? Amen. And for those of you who may, uh, you should know by now, I'm assuming that uh, Pastor DeCosta and Mrs. DeCosta are away. They're out of state celebrating the birth of their grandchild, their newborn grandbaby. So we just want to give a shout out to them. Um, I didn't get a notice, but I believe Pastor Darrell is with Josiah. Yes, but it, so when you see us kind of not here, uh, we out with our families and doing things and you know, God is just making way for us to be in different spaces and places. But Pastor, De, Pastor Darrell is with his son, Josiah. Josiah is in a chess tournament and Josiah is in the top, what is it? Um, re, he's like in the top, over the top 50. Um, out of a hundred and some or more um, that's he in a chess tournament. And so Pastor Darrell is with his son taking care of him. And so, you know, we're just so grateful, um, you know, how God is just giving us opportunity. And I just thank God for giving me an opportunity to be away last week. So God just allowing us to be in some spaces and places and, and just doing some things. But we just wanted you to know when you don't see us all out, um, we're, not, we're not out here just not doing anything, but we, we are here with family and, and doing ministry. Amen? Amen. Amen. While you're still standing, um, I was going to ask you, oh, Joyce Hall is in the house. Hey, Joyce. <laughs> it's good seeing you. If you wouldn't mind turning with me to the Gospel of Matthew, I'm going to a very familiar, um, a very familiar chapter and story, if you will. And in fact, it's one that I have done a couple of sermons from here before. And I was working, I was working on another sermon, or I was trying to work on another sermon. And, and th those of you who are ministers and you know, you know, you know when you're trying to work on the word and it's just not working, then you realize that's not where you're supposed to go because you just keep, keep walking into this wall and it just, it's just not connecting. So I just put that to the side because I'm like, it clearly, you, you know, God, you don't want me over here. So we, you know, we're going to put that to the piece. But he took me back to one that I did years ago, as a matter of fact. And I felt, a settled, felt, I felt settled in my spirit that this is where I was supposed to be. And so um, I'm praying that, and I pray that you'll pray with me that this is exactly where God is leading us to just to go back and revisit a message that we've done before. And this message was about the other, the other little boats that were out on the sea of Galilee when the storm went up. Amen. So if you turn with me to Mark, the fourth chapter, uh, we're looking at verses 35 and 41. I will be reading from the New Living Translation, if you will. And Mark writes for us, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. And so they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind. Although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? 
And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still! And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, Why, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this man? That's a sermon by, that's another sermon we can do another time. <laughs> who is this, who is this man? And so this morning, you know, we want to just talk about the other boats that were out there following Jesus. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this moment, this time of worship, dear Lord, this time of fellowshipping with each other, but more importantly, this time of fellowshipping and worshiping with you. We've gathered within this sacred space here physically, and for those who are worshiping with us online, dear God, we are here on one accord to lift you up and to be in your presence and to hear from you. We've heard from you through prayer. We've heard from you through the ministry of song. And now, God, we're coming to hear from you from your word, dear Lord. And so, God, as I stand here behind the sacred desk, I pray that your word in this moment will do what you have so ordained and proclaimed it to do, that it would touch whoever heart that you have desired it for to touch, that you will bring revelation, whatever is needed in this moment for those who are here and listening. God, we're just standing and believing that you will do whatever it is necessary for all of us who have gathered here. So we just bless you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. Many, many sermons, and as I've already shared, many sermons and a lot of songs have been inspired by this particular um, passage, if you will. You know, songs like the one James Cleveland wrote, um, Peace Be Still. Um, you know, he wrote, Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness. No shelter or help is nigh. That is one of his hymns, his, one of his songs that, that just touches the soul, if you will, especially when you're just dealing with some, a lot of, when you're dealing with your own storms. And then there's another hymn of the church. And I remember my grandmother and the choir that she was on back at our home church. Um, they would have on their little black robes and they would have on the little church hats, if you will. And they would open up their hymn book and they would sing, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. The word goes on and it says that when the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rules the wind and the water, stand by me. It's just something about those hymns of the church that we may not necessarily appreciate them when we were growing up and going through, but as life starts life and then we start getting older, uh, we begin to understand and can embrace those songs because we've been through some stuff, amen? And so these songs, these songs um, symbolize, if you will, the, uh, the, the disciples' fear and their anguish. And these songs and sermons just tell us that Jesus has authority over all of the storms that we may encounter in life. And as I was sharing, most of the time, the song and sermons tend to focus on what was happening with the disciples and what was happening with Jesus while they were out there on the water in the midst of this storm. But however, as we are reading from this passage, Mark tells us something that is often overlooked and not always mentioned, if you will. It's not mentioned in the Gospels of Matthew and it's not mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. But Mark records for us that there was not just the boat that Jesus was in, that the disciples and Jesus were in out on the sea, but there were some other boats that were out there with them at the same time. 
It also suggests that these boats were not random boats that just happened to be out on the water, but, but these boats were out there with intention. They were intentionally following Jesus. Jesus had been teaching out there on the Sea of Galilee. And because so many people had come to hear him speak, Jesus had asked the disciples, I just need to step in the boat so he could push out from the shore so that the people on the shore could see him and hear him. So there were a lot of people who were out there listening to Jesus and we can pretty much assume that those who were in the other boats were there listening to him as well as he was preaching from the boat that he was in. So Mark then tells us that after Jesus had been preaching, and he had been preaching and teaching for quite a while, that he was tired. He had been out there in the hot sun. He had been teaching. He had been healing. And so it was afterwards that Jesus then says to the disciples, look, let's get into the boat, and we need to go over onto the other side. We're going to cross over to the other side. And then Mark specifically says that other boats followed him. The other boats followed him. Mark is giving us a, a detailed eyewitness account that more than likely came from the disciple Peter. Mark was not one of the original disciples, but tradition has it that Mark was Peter's scribe. He was one who followed Peter. He was a disciple of Peter. And so the apostles would have had disciples as well that they would have poured into and taught. If you read about Paul, he had people who followed him. And so Mark was one who had been a follower of Peter, but he was also one whom Peter was, would be giving, it would be informing Mark as to what he had seen and what he had experienced with Jesus. He would have recorded, had Mark to record the life, ministry, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in turn, Peter was teaching Mark about who Jesus was. And the, when I was saying discipling him, he was becoming, he was a follower. So it appears that as the course of time with this relationship between Peter and Mark, um, over the course of time, we could see that it grew to the point that when you look over in 1 Peter, the first, uh, fifth chapter, Peter refers to Mark as his son. So their relationship became very close. This Mark, who is telling us this story, this Mark, who is a follower of Peter, this is the same Mark that we find over in the book of Acts. This is the same Mark who is sometimes called John Mark. This is the same Mark who traveled with Paul and Barnabas. And this is also the same Mark who goes out on a mission trip and he quits. And because he quits, we all have an idea what Paul is like. Paul wasn't feeling this thing that you start a ministry and then all of a sudden you quit because you tired or whatever the issue was. So, because he quit, it caused an issue between Paul and Barnabas. They split, but in the end, Mark is given another chance with Barnabas, and because he was given another chance, we now have the gospel of Mark. I don't know about you, but aren't you glad that God just gives us another chance when, when we mess up, when we quit, when we shouldn't have quit, when we have fallen back, and then when we have fallen off of the mark, that he will allow us to come back and just think if Mark had not been allowed to come back, we wouldn't have this gospel that we're reading from today. So we can take it pretty, pretty accurately that Mark is giving us an accurate story that has been relayed to him by Peter. And he tells us that a, a fierce storm suddenly arises out there on the Sea of Galilee 
And the thing of it is, is that it was not a fierce storms coming up over the Sea of Galilee was not unusual. It was something that was very common because of the geographical location of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was surrounded by a lot of hills and, 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 the, and it says that some of the hills were as high as 2,000 feet up in the air. And so when evening would come, the, the warm air from the sea would rise up and the cool air coming down from the hillsides would meet with the warm air and there a storm would occur. And so unlike today, they didn't have any means of predicting when a storm was going to come up. Uh -huh. but, but what we do know is that with Jesus, who was in the boat, that they were also experienced fishermen. And so you just seem like you can't get a break. And the thing about storms, just like in nature, sometimes we can see a storm coming. We can see one brewing off over the horizon and we can get ourselves prepared. But then there are some storms that hit us with absolutely no warning. You don't see it coming. You didn't get a heads up that a storm was brewing. You just, all of a sudden, you find yourself caught up in a storm. And the other thing about storms that happen in nature but also happen in our lives, sometimes these storms come up quick. They come up and they're over with. A matter of a few minutes. And then you got some storms that seem like they last a lifetime. You got some storm that you like, when is this going to ever end? It just seems like it just continues to rage. And what I've learned through life, and just because I've been around the sun a whole lot of times, just found out that what God will do sometimes, he will either calm the storm that we're in, or sometimes he's going to let that storm rage. But what he will do is just calm us so that we can walk through that storm with grace and Walk through it with mercy. But here, however, here in this storm, Jesus, because Jesus is who he is, because he's omniscient, because he is all-knowing, he, he already knew a storm was coming. He told them boys, get that boat anyway. He knew a storm was coming, and he would do the same with us. He would know that something is already coming, but he's going to ask us, I want you to go for it anyway. I want you to make that move anyway, even though he knows that as we move forward, he already know we're going to run up into a situation. He already know we're going to run up into something that's going to be a struggle for us. But he just wants us to remind us that he's going to be out there with us no matter what it is that shall come our way. That he will not allow us to face a storm without him. He will go through it with us and grace us in that matter. But getting back to these disciples who were professional fishermen who knew how to navigate the ocean, that sea, whenever a storm came up, this one, this one storm, they had not seen anything like it before. This one was overwhelming them. This one made them think or question whether or not they, would able to be, they were able to survive the storm because they asked the question, do you care not that we might drown out here in this storm. And the thing of it is, the scripture never mentions that it was raining. It only mentions that it was the wind was blowing, was suggesting that the wind was so powerful that it was kicking up the waves so high that it was causing their little boat to become overwhelmed with water. And so they were out here struggling. They could see what the storm was doing to them. But here is the thing. They weren't the only ones out in the storm. Because we have to remember that the other boats left the shore right along with them 
and they too were fighting the same storm. So here is our first takeaway. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own issues and our own struggles to stay afloat, if you will, and that's normal and it's natural. It's normal and natural to feel like that we're the only ones who are going through, but the reality is that there are other people out here on the same sea battling the same storm and fighting the same struggle that we are fighting. Those other boats out on the water, they too were being filled with water from the same wind and the same waves, just like the boat that Jesus and his disciples were in. And so it is really normal again, and it's easy for us to become preoccupied with our own personal struggles and not realize that there are other boats out there on the sea of life fighting the same fight that we are trying to fight. We're not the only ones who feel like we're catching hell. We're not the only one who need a miracle. We're not the only ones who just want the storm to stop. But there are people who are going through what we are facing, but so often we can't see past our own storm. We can't see past our own struggle, our own grief, our own hurt. We can't see past it until someone like Mark comes along to remind us that there are other boats out there experiencing the exact same storm that we're experiencing. The difference is that Jesus wasn't riding in their boat. Jesus was over in the disciples' boat. Yet, when Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and the wave, when Jesus spoke, peace be still, the storm didn't just calm down for the disciples and Jesus in their little boat, but the storm also calmed down for the people who were out there in their little boats. Jesus not only blessed the disciples in their boat, but he also blessed those who were also following out in their boat. They weren't with him per se physically, but they were still following him and he still blessed them. And so when the disciples ran to Jesus out of fear for their lives, to be honest, they weren't thinking about those other boats that were out there. They were thinking about themselves and their boat because they said, oh, we're not going to drown out here. They were not considering the other boats that had followed them again, but when Jesus spoke peace, he also spoke peace for the other folks. So you may be asking me, Pastor Kay, what is your point? The point is this, the other boats should serve as a reminder to us that when we are praying and seeking God to be delivered from our own storms, that we remember and cover others who may or may not know that they're battling the, same, the storm, they're through their storms of life. And here is another takeaway. Mark doesn't tell us, he doesn't say to us how or why the other boats decided to follow Jesus. He just says they followed him. We don't know if they heard Jesus preaching and made the decision, well, we're going to go wherever Jesus is going, which is a very reasonable, um, very reasonable that that was what they were doing. They heard him and decided, well, we're going to follow him. But here's another point that I would like for us to consider. Maybe, maybe it wasn't so much that they were following Jesus, but could it be that they were so impressed by the men who were in the boat with Jesus. Let me explain what I mean. Perhaps they saw Peter and Andrew over in the boat, and they knew Peter and Andrew were fishermen just like they were. Maybe when they looked at Peter and go like, well, wait a minute. Peter's over here with Jesus who is preaching this new message but I remember what Peter used to be like. I remember Peter had a little bit of a temper. I remember Peter would not only cuss you, but he would cut you if necessary. 
Peter was always packing something, but Peter, the troublemaker, Peter, the cusser, in the boat with Jesus, Peter, I, I, I believe as they were just looking, they were, they, it's a possibility, I don't know, it's a possibility, they weren't so much at Jesus, but they were like, who are these people we know, who we know about them, over here in this boat with this man who is supposed to be the son of God? I, I think that perhaps they even looked at Simon, who we call Simon the Zealot. Simon was militant. Simon was all about overthrowing Rome, but he wasn't trying to do it in a peaceful way. Simon was about, if I got to get up in here and shoot everybody, that's what's going to happen. If that's going to happen, that, that was Simon. He was a, he, Simon chose violence. Anybody know people who just choose violence all the time? He, Simon chose violent, violence if he wanted. So, so maybe the people in the other boat we're looking at the men who were in the boat with Jesus and decided there must be something about this man in this boat with them. We're going to follow them. Because what they saw were these men who they knew what they used to be like. But all of a sudden, these men have changed. They're not like what they used to be. I don't know who they are, but... They're not like they used to be. And so again, maybe the other boats follow because if Jesus could change these men, perhaps they were thinking then maybe he could change us. Maybe he can do something for us. And so they decided to follow him. And because you and I are followers, and this is the other thing we need to keep in mind, because you and I are followers, because we are on the World Wide Web, and these cameras can just scan around this church, and people can see who is up in this church. Someone, somewhere, is always watching you. You can take that to the bank. Somebody, somebody is always watching you, and I'm not talking about people that you know. I'm talking about people that we don't know. And the thing of it is that our direct influence, me directly influencing someone that I know, that's, it is very strong. But I'm going to tell you what I think may be even stronger is when you have an indirect influence on somebody that you don't know. You don't know them, but they've been watching you. You, haven't, you don't know their name, but they know yours. They, they see where you are, they, they were like, they up in that church every Sunday. They're watching and they're watching, and so we have to be mindful of that. And so let me tell you the reason why we have to be so watchful and be mindful. The disciples were fighting to keep that boat from sinking. The disciples were out there fighting because they didn't want to drown out there in the sea. The other, the people in the other boat, they were doing the same thing. The people in the other boat, however, couldn't see the fear and the desperation of the disciples who were over in their boat. But what they could see that would have been on the back of every boat would have been a lantern that would have been lit on the back of the boat. I believe that those folks in the other boat figured out that as long as they could see the light on the disciples' boat, that they were going in the right direction. All they have to do is keep their eye on that light on that disciples' boat, then I know I'm heading in the right direction. I believe people do the same with us. As long as they can still see the light of Jesus in us, they know that if they follow us, they're going to be heading in the right direction as well. 
They know that if they can keep their eye on you, even though you are in the midst of your storm, they know you're going through a storm, but at the same time, they're saying, if I can keep the watch or the light that they're carrying, then I can follow them as well. That people will follow him. People will follow the light that is with us, the light of Jesus Christ that is with us. The reality is for us is that we are often struggling with our own fear, and we are often faltering with our own faith if we're, if we're for real. And we're sometimes dealing with our own doubts if Jesus is going to come through for us. But out there, out on the sea of life, not far away from us, are other people too who are struggling and straining to keep the light in view, to keep our light in view, to follow us, and they're bailing with all of their might to keep from going under because they believe that as long as they can keep their eye, they're going to be all right. Their motivation is this, that their belief that if Jesus is with you, if Jesus is sustaining you through your storm, if Jesus is carrying you because they know the weight that you're carrying, then maybe, just maybe, Jesus will be able to help them to carry the weight that they're under as well. So what those people did out on that little boat that they were in, they kept rowing. They kept rowing. They kept bailing the water because they were confident that everything was going to be all right as long as they could keep up with you and with Jesus. We have to always remember, especially when we are going through that someone, somewhere, they're watching us. They want to see how we're handling the storm. They want to see how we're going to press through. They want to see, they're going to give up, or they're going to hang in there. They want to see if we're going to send out invitations to pity parties. They want to see what we're going to do. Because again, you've heard before, oftentimes a lot of people, what they see in us is the closest thing they get to a Bible because they're not necessarily reading it. But they know that you're in church. They know that you are a professing Christian. And so they're watching us when we're dealing with our storms. But here's the other thing about Jesus. As we said earlier, Jesus already knew that storm was going to come up. He told him to get in the boat anyway. He told him we're going to go ahead and cross over on the other side. He knew what was going to happen. Sometimes Jesus will allow storms to arise in our life. And that storm is not so much about us. It is about what God is going to do through us. You see, God will use your storm to draw somebody to him because they're watching. He will use your anguish. He will use your pain. He will use your struggle. He will use all of that because as people are watching, it could draw people to him. You've heard me say numerous times that, that God is an economist. He's an economist because, because he doesn't allow any of our experiences. He doesn't allow the good experience, the bad experience, the not so good. He doesn't allow any of it to go to waste, but what he does is he uses all of them, all of them. Someone may be watching you right now as to how you are handling your storm, and through Jesus, they're going to be drawn to him. So as we close on this, after Jesus calms the waters, after the disciples had an opportunity to collect themselves, I could imagine they then looked out over, over the waters, and they remembered the mother boats that left the shore the same time they did. I think they remembered and began to realize, my goodness, they were out here fighting the same storm just like we were fighting. I, began, I guess I can imagine they were probably wondering, I wonder if they were just as afraid of the storm as we were afraid of the storm. I'm wondering, I guess I begin to wonder and wondering what they're thinking. What did they thought about when they looked out there and they saw all of those boats that made it through the storm just like they did? That they realized that they weren't the only ones who survived. 
that they began to realize that this man who was in this boat with them, again, not only calmed the storm for them, but he calmed the storm for those who were just following him. That he's able to settle their hearts and their minds regardless of how close they may be to him. So when we are here fighting our storms, we have to remember we're not the only ones who are in it. We're not the only ones that Jesus is going to help us to survive because they're going to come. Our responsibility is to stay strong and stay focused on the one who's in the boat with us. Keep Jesus in your boat. Don't let Jesus go anywhere else. You always keep him in your boat and you, let, you just ride it out with him. And here is the thing, because Jesus made the promise before they left the shore. He said, let us go over to the other side. You got to hold that promise in your heart right now that no matter what kind of storm God brings in your life, always remember, you're going to get over on the other side because he's going to see you through. Amen? Amen. As our decision counselors were just come to the floor, and we want to first pray and then extend an invitation for anyone who is here in person and anyone who may be worshiping with us online as we remain standing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you that you will be with us even though we, God, sometimes we don't feel you. Sometimes we do believe that you in the back of the boat sleep. And we out here struggling out here on this water. But God, I thank you that this word reminds us that the only reason you were resting because you knew you already had it. You, you got it. You got us. And so God, in our human weakness, we sometimes forget that you really do have us and that you will bring us through. So God, I just pray that you would just strengthen our hearts and strengthen our minds and just strengthen us with a comfort and peace that when we are struggling and how the enemy will come at us and make us doubt and go through these changes, that we just be reminded that you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. So God, I'm just praying for anyone now who's going through a storm. God, I'm going to pray that you would calm that storm. I pray that you would just settle that storm right on down. But God, if that is not your will in this moment in this time, then God, please, in the precious name of Jesus, Settle their hearts and their mind. Just give them that peace so that they can ride it out and get to the other side. So we just thank you and we bless you. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who are in the sanctuary, and for those of you who are worshiping with us, on, us online, our phone lines are open for anyone who you need in need of prayer. Uh, if you would like to become a partner here at First Christian, or whatever it is that you're standing in need of, feel free to call in. The number should be coming up on your screen where you can call in and should that be your desire, or you can just send a message, if you will, to those in our media team. We'll, we'll see it and review it. For those who are within the sanctuary, if there's anyone here and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then we will invite you to connect with our decision counselor. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise right now. Let's connect with the decision counselor. Amen. God is good.